Let me say now a bit about uh, tonight's uh, speaker, Tuna Tashan Kok, uh, from the University of Amsterdam. Tuna is a professor of urban governance and planning at UVA in the Department of Geography, Planning and Development Studies uh, over in, uh, in Amsterdam. Tuna's got an amazing uh, track record. She's worked at some of the big planning institutions that, and universities across Europe, from METU in Turkey, uh, in the, back in the old days, Tuna, uh, to uh, Delft. She's worked in Leuven. And she moved to Amsterdam to take up a chair uh, in planning there in 2015. She's also a visiting professor here at the Bartlett School of Planning. Uh, that's been for the last, the last few years. Tuna's work has been absolutely cutting edge. I've been very privileged to, to work with her over the years on a variety of projects. And I'm saying it kind of boils down to three or four areas. She's one of the foremost writers on our understandings of the contractual state. So some of Tuna's work cross nationally with colleagues in Brazil, here in England, uh, working with Rob Atkinson, the University of West of England, looked at the nature of contractualism, contractual, contractualized citizenship. Uh, and uh, policy delivery. Some of that work is really groundbreaking and uh, I thought it was really cutting edge stuff that Tuna's been involved with. She also, a few years back, worked a lot with Guy Vetton and others on understanding neoliberalism, neoliberal planning, deconstructing, demystifying what neoliberal planning consists of. I think quite a critical way, sympathetic but critical way uh, in, in some of that work, Tuna, uh, which was very, very influential. We worked together on a big European project on diversities, looking at social diversity in the city and governing urban diversity, which is the focus of our work. And Tuna's more recent work has been on, which is going to talk about this evening much more, I, I kind of put it into the category of demystifying the private sector in urban development. So really thinking through different types of private sector activity, private sector structures, and private sector if you like, um, I guess broadly speaking, just what it does, it's social relations and the way in which it operates. And Tuna's work on demystifying this, I think, has been absolutely cutting edge. She set up a big network at the University of Amsterdam with some legal scholars as well, thinking about codes of capital, bringing together legal studies with urban planning, urban geography, and urban development. So you can talk a bit about some of that work tonight. We, again, we're very privileged uh, to work with Tuna and her colleagues, some of us here in the School of Planning on the WIC project, and looking at the relationship between investment and regulation in a city. And that's what Tuna's going to speak to us about tonight. So, Tuna, I'll give you, I'll give you about 45, 50 minutes, and then there'll be time for questions and discussions afterwards. Thank you, Mike. I was given the message we should keep distance because of the microphones uh, interfering with each other, so you have to keep distance from me. <laughs> Hi. Good evening, hi, thanks for this uh, kind invitation. It's great to be in London and doing this lecture. I will try to stay a little bit close to here to deal with my slides. I'm going to talk about the transformation of property-led planning by looking at spatial governance landscapes through a relational approach. I'll tell you more about what I mean in a minute. But just last week, I came across with this in um, The Guardian, your uh, leveling up secretary talking about the planning reset. And the planning reset um, where he was blaming regulations for blocking the housing delivery. I find it very interesting because he used discourses of bonfire of red tape, of how regulations need greater flexibility and they actually block housing delivery uh, so because especially of the requirements on affordability, sustainability, all these normative things and finally of course blaming the European Union and I find it very interesting because even though the context is very different politically and planning wise the, these discourses remind very much of what we are going through in the Dutch context. And I'll talk a little bit about this transition tonight. Um, not only because of the planning system is transforming, but also because the, the idea of property-led planning is changing. 
When we were studying the contradictions of neoliberal planning together with T. Barton some 10, 12 years ago, uh, beginning of uh, the 2000s, well, actually 20 years ago, sorry. <laughs> um, it was easier to describe what was going on. It was all about land and property market actors becoming the key players, public sector actors uh, losing their control and decentralizing, lots of pri privatization taking place. And finally, and most importantly, tra traditional planning practices were not anymore able to catch up with the speed of the property markets. And that's they were ineffective and very passive in the background. This is how we criticize property-led planning. Coming to today, and uh, Mike and colleagues from UCL recently published this article in uh, Progress in Planning, we see property-led planning taking a different turn through targets. And targets, as actually, as uh, they describe it, uh, virtual statecraft, creating a form of certainty within a messy and complex environment through targets, actually enabling to bypass the requirements, enabling bypass discontents, enabling bypass creative thinking about uh, problems like affordability, where actual places become stimulated worlds ripe for calculation and remaking. And I find it very interesting because this exactly shows us what has been happening in the Dutch planning context. Of course, Netherlands known to be the heaven of planners at some point. You see on my right uh, a typical plan from the southern part of Amsterdam shaping the neighborhoods uh, and the city um, actually through the 1934 extension plan which aim to create new housing capacity through livable neighborhoods, through top-down planning. Um, in the same areas in the south, 1990s, Zaldas came, came out. And Zaldas uh, is the financial center of the Netherlands, actually. And it was a very property-driven form of development where the national government, local government, and all the other actors work together to create this um, financial center hit by global financial crisis in 2008, and then turned into a kind of construction site with changing targets, changing ideas, and still, I mean, these are recent images, uh, offices being canceled, housing projects coming up, some green spaces created, really uh, making us all wondering what's going to happen next. So this is a transition, actually, from plan-led to project-led or property-led planning. Recent times, we are working on this book project together with Sara Özol and Andre Legarza on urban property markets and planning regulation, mainly looking at Amsterdam and tonight, I want to shape my talk around the findings that we are putting together in this book. Um, my talk is going to cover three important aspects coming from this book. First of all, I want to talk about fragmented and complex property-led planning. How did we get here? Secondly, I want to talk about the fundamentals of what actually shapes the city between the property market and planning regulation. And finally, I want to talk about the new approaches, the relational approaches to understand this complexity. 2008 financial crisis, like everybody else, created a big problem for the construction industry. This is the total figures of construction in the Netherlands. And you can see the drop by 2010. Of course, funny enough, 2009, just after the crisis, they were still investing on land, water, and road construction, being typical Dutch. But by 2010, you see, nothing was happening anymore. What did this do at the regulation side? The Dutch government, by 2010, March, put together a very simple abstract act called Crisis and Recovery Act. 
and it's aimed to fast execute. It's aimed for fast execution of spatial plans, and through the years that followed, and still today, this act is uh, in charge of urban development. It transformed into something different. Today, it is about stimulating innovative and sustainable projects, which has nothing to do with crisis and recovery anymore. But it does every year by adding new clauses to the regulations, create new forms of property-led planning to control the market activity, stimulate the market activity. Followed by 2010 on Havings Vet, which in translation, Environment and Planning Act, aiming at digitally putting together all the regulations dealing with spatial organization, creating a completely new framework, and in the words of Dutch government, to simplify the regulations for spatial projects and making it easier to start up projects. A little bit inspiration for your leveling up secretary. They have been working on this act as for the last 10 years, we thought it was going to come into charge by January next year, but we just learned that it's delayed till July. What is interesting about this act is it has this very simplified discourses around less rules and more space for initiatives. And as Mike referred, I put together a reading club to read this act together with lawyers, because I thought it would be very difficult for me to understand it, it turned out it wasn't, actually. Because it's very abstract and very easygoing act telling it's going to be easier for everyone to start up projects. But using the discourses of inclusion, making it more participatory and more people-oriented planning, while actually aiming to make it easier for uh, property development. Meantime, Crisis and Recovery Act continues to develop with new clauses. 2016, a new clause came out. Innovative projects, uh, space for innovative projects. 2018, another clause came. Experimenting with flexible zoning plans for whatever <laughs> that actually means, flexible zoning plans. It's very interesting, but very fundamental to explain what is taking place in the Dutch context today. This is uh, Almere, which was a new town, developed in the 1960s, 70s, completely out of uh, nothing, on empty land, um, as a plan-led development project. It became a very unattractive and boring place, so the city of Almere first followed a very entrepreneurial approach to put together investors, entrepreneurs, retailers to regenerate the city center, classic 1990s uh, entrepreneurship. But then they decided they could actually use these new regulation on the crisis and recovery, on the experimentation and innovation to, c to become the pioneers of alternative housing in the Netherlands, actually in the world. They are very much known with their self-built housing areas. But what is very interesting in that, of course, this act is very much motivating self-building, cooperative building, and so on. But for whom, actually? You may think that this may help for affordable housing delivery. Actually, not really. This is another neighborhood in Amsterdam this time, Borneo uh, Island. These are self-built houses. You needed at least 500,000 to begin with to put up and construct these houses. And then, of course, because you included self-help buildings in your project, then you could create these market-oriented, market-based, luxurious apartment developments at the same time. So, yeah, these courses are saying something laws and regulations and policies are doing something else. Together with Sarah Özol, we wanted to go down into understanding the, f the governance architecture underlying this residential delivery. What kind of policies, laws, regulations, planning 
uh, related um, documents actually shape the Dutch cities today, especially when it comes to residential development. To find out that it is a very fragmented landscape. In this fragmented landscape, we see, first of all, public sector regulations trying to shape market activities becoming extremely diverse, overlapping, conflicting with each other, creating tensions with each other. <laughs> Actually, conflicting regulations at different levels of governance. Secondly, we also realize there are intra-organizational discrepancies. So the Ministry of Housing says something, um, <laughs> some municipalities say something else, a district says completely something else, creating a very confusing and chaotic regulatory environment. And finally, we find out, we call them fuzzy narratives, because they were really describing the market actors, investors, developers, the perceptions were completely overriding each other, creating a very fragmented, chaotic landscape. These are the words of local planners working in the municipality of Amsterdam. Regulations became too abstract, containing changeable visions, regulatory chaos and lack of direction from the national government, because of course we are lacking it now. Mismatch between policy and how policy works um, in real life. So not only for developers, investors and the property industry, but for the local planners who are actually operationalizing these regulations, it is a very um, confusing environment under the umbrella of increased flexibility. This form of fragmented and complex governance of cities were referred by other works. Uh, Ronan Pedersen wrote about the fragmented spate, space, uh, state, sorry, and um, late uh, Gordon MacLeod was talking about asking who actually governs at which level and through which spaces, the cities. Coming from the similar um, questions, uh, trying to find answers to similar questions, uh, together with Mike Racco and uh, Patrick Legales from uh, Science Po, we had this research project called VIC, What is Governed in Cities? Several colleagues uh, here tonight have been part of this project. Together, we looked into residential investment landscapes and the governance infrastructure behind them. And for the rest of the second part, I want to talk about this project results in terms of what actually shapes the city. And the answer to this question, if you think about it in a very abstract level, is easy today, in a way. Because on the one hand, we see the changing role of state, which is very much dependent on the market. And because of this dependency to market and constantly changing role of state, we see institutional transformations uh, in spatial governance actually shaping the city. It's kind of abstract way to describe it. Turning cities as investment portfolios. And lots of scholars from the critical side studied on the side of the market how this financialization actually influenced the identity of the state. Very influential work of Manuel Albers talking about financialization as an explicit state strategy which actually actively facilitates, pushes and engages in financialization of real estate at the state level, creating a dependency at the local level to the property market activity. What does this do? If we look at property, in Rachel Weber's words, as spatially embedded commodity, you make all the built environments spaces, projects that you create, completely dependent on market dynamics at the end of the day. So we called it in the relationship between the shifts uh, in property markets closely tied to changes in the investor, investment actors behaviors shaped by wider economic and regulatory processes. Because there is this dependency 
that is going on. We can also look at, again from a very abstract level, a project through very different contractual relations. Now here in this figure you see a project in the middle, of course it's a very symbolic uh, project with a neighborhood, a district, a city and different layers of governance around it. And you see private sector actors, public sector actors and communities having financial, contractual, informal, formal relationships with each other at different levels, creating a kind of micro pockets of uh, regulation practices around every single project, turning the city into a collection of these pockets, which are shaped between regulations and market conditions. We can also illustrate this in reality. This is Amsterdam, and I think you can see this, all these little points, colorful points, which shows uh, residential projects either realized or ongoing, planned, and so on. There are about 900 projects. Of course, Amsterdam is a compact little city, and 900 is not a big number if you can think about London. But of course, for a city like Amsterdam, it means that for each of these projects, we have this pocket of micro-regulation practices emerging. Each project has project management teams within the municipality of Amsterdam, mainly not knowing from each other, actually not even having the physical space to be in the municipality. So if you want to meet with them, you would have to go to places in the city. They don't even see each other. They try to develop tools to follow what's happening in the rest of the city. But as one planner told me, it is so complex to understand even what's happening in their own project that they gave up trying to understand other projects. Turning the city into an environment where you see these contractual relations actually popping up, different time frames shaping the city through different time frames and uh, needs of people. What we did in the WIC project, we looked into changing public regulation on the one side and changing property and actor landscapes on the other side and together we did quite a lot of analysis on the basis of regulations on the one side and property investment activities on the other side, published together with uh, some colleagues from here. Basically, I'm going to tell you what these publications very simply say. On the regulation side, we find out that there is increasing flexibility, regulatory fragmentation and reflexive governance and on the property investment side, or property market side, increasing diversity and blurred boundaries of roles. Because now, all of a sudden, you see private sector actors changing roles, also changing roles with the public sector actors, playing each other's roles in very um, unclear decision-making environments. At the end, what shapes the city between regulation and market? There are also perceptions around it. If you look from the market point of view, what shapes the city from coming from the regulation side, all kinds of rules, principles, limita limitations, uh, very authoritarian, very controlling form of shaping the city. When you look from the regulation and public sector side, the perception of the market is very different. It's very much profit-driven, short-term, calculative, pushing, negotiating, lobbying, and so on. But actually, what really shapes the city is market and regulation working together, actually being part of the same entity. On the one hand, we have the property industry with locational and strategic investment decisions, shaping, taking sectoral preferences, investment preferences, locational preferences, shaping the city. At the se uh, on the other side, the public sector, through their locational and strategic spatial development policies, through their land use preferences to define functions, political preferences and locational preferences shaping the city, being part of actually the same entity. What is very interesting here, and we are not the only ones 
thinking this way, lots of scholarship recent times talked about how planners are becoming, actually are part of the market and they are market actors. How planning is actually part of the market activity because it defines what is happening in the market. Uh, Adam Santisto's uh, work was very influential, we used that in our project, but many others write about this form of thinking. And from another point of view, Neil Brenner talks about relational embeddedness and shifting positionality within broader interscalar framework of pattern regularized interdependencies. He talks about complex interdependencies that are created by this connection between the market and regulation shaping the city. Now, coming back to the Dutch planning and thinking these complex interdependencies, it used to be very simple in the Dutch context. We used to have the polder model of decision making. In this model, the private sector actors would always be involved in the decision making processes at very early stages. However, their role was limited to be just part of the construction industry because the state, through passive regulatory, through a passive regulatory system, would define what has to happen in the country in terms of spatial development, housing development, functions and so on. Local governments would instrumentalize them, operationalize those decisions and the property industrial industry's role would be just to realize them. It wasn't really a development sector, really. It was a construction industry following the rules. But it changes through these complex interdependencies that comes from the shift from the welfare state to this entrepreneurial state idea. Now, this is one interdependency. This is the Dutch state trying to make connections between different ministerial departments, municipalities, private industry, telling them that you can actually self-define a problem, make a deal around it, sign a contract, realize it and deliver it. This is one complex interdependency that you can see. Another one is very interesting, metropolitan region of Amsterdam, a region without an official uh, status, official authority. It's a voluntary part partnership between over 30 municipalities around Amsterdam, initiated by the city of Amsterdam, uh, also province, uh, North Holland and uh, transport authority are involved in this uh, uh, metropolitan identity. It's a bottom-up informal engagement of different governmental organizations with neither juridical instruments nor an official status. Yet, they do flexible zoning, they do take flexible zoning decisions. Another complex new interdependency, Holland Metropole. It's a platform established by five big Dutch municipalities, including Amsterdam, and domestic uh, in, in, uh, institutional investors consultants, developers, and so on, representing Dutch urban development in real estate fairs like MIPIM, MAPIC, Expo Real, uh, presenting projects of the Dutch state as a platform. Another one, uh, Association of Invest Institutional Property Investors, who had the authority to sit down with the Amsterdam municipality to negotiate on new regulations really negotiate, like NEPROM, this time uh, institution of developers, Dutch developers, has been very active since 1970s to negotiate with Dutch municipalities. And recently I put together all kinds of knowledge platforms that exist between the property industry actors, municipalities, other public sector actors and communities getting together, establishing platforms of um, understanding of different uh, complex interdependencies. Coming to my final point about new approaches. Here, I think 
I'm not the only one, and we are not the only one in the WIC group, to express the dissatisfaction on publications and work around the property industry. From critical pro uh, scholarship, geography, planning, urban studies scholarship, we see that lots of colleagues have been talking about how property industry is misunderstood through one-dimensional ways of reading the market activity without real awareness that we know actually very little about the industry itself. While actually, if you go into the property industry literature, which we did, you see enormous knowledge around things that we don't actually include them into, the, into our ways of thinking. Is it maybe possible to take, because I hear myself, yeah. thanks. Um, to close this gap, we did publish a couple of articles and more about understanding the property investor actors. Uh, together with Sarah, we looked into the literature to create a kind of categorization of property investors to understand, actually then, using that as a framework, uh, under, uh, um, uh, understand Amsterdam's changing landscape of property investors, we use it as a multi-dimensional uh, framework to read the property investment market. Here in UCL, uh, Mike and colleagues also did uh, studies looking at how we can actually look at the market through the eyes of investors and see the identities of investors and developers together. In my view, we need to widen our scope of thinking when it comes to understanding the property market actors and market activities um, by taking the politics of planning into uh, consideration. There are different scholarships like Polanyi, being an anthropologist, studied the embeddedness of market in urban society. Granovetter, a sociologist, looked into network of social relations shaping the market activity. Or uh, Gerard de Vries, he's a, a, a philosopher, he looked into dispersion of politics outside the uh, established public institutions shaping the property industry, property market. Basically, dynamic processes of making collective decisions through social, political and economic networks, power networks, shaping the markets through asynchronous and chaotic actor landscapes. And to understand this, of course, we need to have a relational understanding of the property market activity in relation to regulations. Frank Hales puts a very interesting point of view, and he's an innovation scientist. He works in sustainability issues by looking at the relationship between institutions and actors. He says, institutions influence the identities, perceptions, and preferences of actors, while at the same time, actors try to shape institutions to suit to their interests. If you think about the complex interdependencies I was presenting to you, you can see this connection very clearly. And to link investor choices to regulatory infrastructures, what we are seeing in our work, and especially I have been working on this ever since I did my PhD, um, we need to better understand the property market actors, especially investors, because they control the capital accumulated in urban environments. Their relations, their cognitive behavior, and investment choices in relation to regulation. We need new approaches through maybe many other things, but new institutional theories, system innovation, political science, new institutional economics. All these fields actually look into these interdependencies, but in our work, we take them into the side of uncritical thinking and we don't really consider them. We need to read the regulations in relation to market shifts. And of course, I'm not the only one. There are many of us uh, studying more than the little list I provided here, this kind of dependency. How 
does it look in reality? Here is the property investment activity in Amsterdam from 2006 to uh, 2020, uh, showing how in different sectors the investment activity went down in the, uh, just following the 2008 crisis and went up, doubling the amount of investment as of 2013-14. Well, let's locate our famous Crisis and Recovery Act in 2010. Of course, it's not the only reason why the market activity increased, but definitely the active approach to stimulate the market activity was very influential. Well, we went deeper into it because we really wanted to understand whether it had an impact by looking at the regulations as of 2000 to today by different cabinets, trying to understand the politics behind them, by looking at regulations issued by national, provincial, municipal and metropolitan region actors. And you see here a very interesting picture. And in this picture, what you see, 2008, the crisis, following the crisis period, more activity at the regulation site. Let's put our figure here, and it just overlaps the time frames. You see from 2000, let's say, 14 onwards, enormous amount of regulatory activity only by the municipality of Amsterdam and metropolitan region, trying to shape the market through many different types of regulations. Some of them are extremely rigid, some of them are extremely abstract, creating a very unclear environment to read. What more was the rise of non-binding regulations. Uh, we, took, we put together recently uh, the amount of it because we were interested in how much of the binding regulations changed as of 2000s. You see, it was half-half in 2000s uh, in terms of shaping the market activity. Today, it's around 34% of the regulations actually have binding powers. So creating this flexible regulatory environment. At the same time, you don't need to understand this table, but what this table shows is part of a table we use in our uh, publication. Uh, all the we looked into all the municipalities around Amsterdam and looked at the regulations around the topics, and you see the topics up there, uh, to see to what extent on the same topic the municipalities around Amsterdam use different kinds of instrumentation. You see different norms, different principles, different time frames described literally in the same physical environment. So some of them, again, very rigid regulations, but because the relationship between these regulations are not binding, in other words, if you find Amsterdam too rigid, which our interviewee said, investors found regulations in Amsterdam too rigid, they could go to other municipalities around it, which actually happened. What we see also in the background, changing politics of planning regulation, we see how the Ministry of Ministry that deals with the public housing delivery changed its identity through the post-war years. First, it was really about recovery and delivering housing, and then it became really welfare state in 1960s, public housing and spatial planning, and through time, 2010, Ministry on Housing and Spatial Development totally vanished, replaced by Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. And it was really the years where it didn't really matter anymore because we had this flexible understanding of the state dealing with housing delivery. Just now, recently, 2022, Ministry of Public Housing and Spatial Planning, exactly the same title from 1965, comes back. Very interesting. We follow this up by looking at the website of the ministry. 2014, they had this mid-price rental housing in the Netherlands is an excellent investment opportunity, inviting international investors to the country. By 2019, this website vanished. 
you would just get the error messages now because the ministry disappeared and a new one came, this ministry that I was talking about through the new cabinet, uh, through binding performance agreements. These are the discourses and norms they are describing. Construction of flexible housing, relieving the pressure on municipalities with regional agreements. Again, pinpointing the soft ways to shape the market activity. NOBI is the national strategy on spatial planning, comes with these discourses as well. This is the new strategy, spatial strategy of the Dutch state shaping the affordable housing issue because we have a big issue in the country. All these approaches, integrated approach by the national government, aiming to promote cooperation between different stakeholders, building strong, attractive, healthy cities, finally identifying the national interests, making national choices, offering guidance for local considerations. Look how they are curating the expectations. As opposed to, this is 1991 national strategy which developed the Vinex areas. If you are familiar with the Dutch planning context, these are the new towns. This was the way they did planning at the national government level at that time with areas literally defining where you could develop housing, at what level, how many, and by which actors. And also, they had norms like 30% affordable, density issues, and so on and so forth. So you see the shift very clearly. At the same time, when you look at the metropolitan region, metropolitan region, without its official identity, tries new regulations. They, had, they came up with the key um, areas regulation in 2019, targeting the construction of 5,000 units per year, mainly outside Amsterdam. So you see Amsterdam uh, as a whole, it's all about development outside of Amsterdam, through different kind of soft regulations, because they don't have authority, housing deal, making uh, housing agreements with sub-regions, trying to find a way, actually becoming quite uh, influential when you look through the investment activity. Because here, I'm not going to show you a lot of quantitative analysis, but what we find out, that investors spread through the region more than ever after the key areas regulation came. The housing development in the key areas doubled and also, what is very interesting, majority of investors uh, with assets uh, were developed uh, in areas in more than one municipality. In other words, investors who uh, were looking for new areas to invest, they went back into those areas, developing new capacities of investment, uh, leaving Amsterdam center behind. But also investors did at the same time, realizing the forms of flexibility that came with this form of development, they established deal teams. Deal teams consisted of lawyers, law firms, consultancies to sit down with municipalities to negotiate their dynamic policies, trying to find their ways through complex regulation and uncertainty because the market actors, mainly investors, were very unhappy about the uncertainty the current regulatory environment offered. Here in this picture, we see just before 2008 crisis, the investment volumes uh, with the uh, investment heat maps. It's just an illustration. It's not a qualitative, quantitative analysis, but you can see actually the distribution outside the Amsterdam city center, all these new areas emerging like Amstelveen, Hilversum, Harlem as new areas of investment. We can see this much clearer in this figure which shows the domestic international investments. This is just before the crisis. Uh, the dark points are international, gray points are domestic investors. You see a 50-50 balance. Of course, crisis hits 
but look what happened after the crisis. Not only that, the international activity doubled, but also they spread through the entire region uh, in a very visible way. A recent publication literally came out today, shows what is not working. Here in this picture, we see lack of comprehensive planning tools to shape and stimulate the housing production, missing the infrastructure to link municipalities. Also infrastructure to literally link the uh, built environments because there is no ministry supporting some kind of transportation facility, for example. We see fragmented political and juridical power in the background without consistent regulatory framework to shape the market activity. In this publication, we ask for um, looking at the affordability issue through a, a, a regional perspective, regional relational perspective, because we realize that that form of macro scale thinking may offer some form of certainty to market activity. Coming to the end of my uh, lecture, again, a little bit abstracting, I like abstracting ideas. What shapes the city? And here we see the state, the market, citizens, and planning as a tool, as a mediator between different actors. Actually, the figure is a bit misleading because in reality, we have diversity of actors in each actor category, making the picture look like this. Very different types of actors in different uh, actor categories. Also putting planning into these different interdependencies. Together with Mike recently, we looked into the ambiguities created by the positionalities of planning between these different types of actors to figure out that there are actually five types of ambiguities that emerges because of the position of planning uh, through legitimacy, through speciality, through temporality, politicization and performativity that planning activity is trying to describe, actually making the picture mainly <laughs> look like this, creating lots of ambiguities between different positions of planning trying to shape the relations between different actors. So rethinking property-led planning, in my view, becomes more complex in this picture. We need to deal with ambiguities. And to deal with that, in practice, what we need is legitimate decisions that incorporate range of voices. We need political reforms and tools embedded in market-led planning. We need qualitative, less numerical objectives to create substance in urban planning. We need to prioritize the needs of communities and residents when describing the norms that shape the market activity. We need to develop mechanisms and tools to spread the social value created by projects to, to, to a wider uh, scale of cities. So in my view, and it's my last, uh, I think, thought, we need relational thinking, we need to understand property market activity in relation to regulation. We need political engagement. We cannot uh, disregard the politics of planning in this picture. And also we need to understand municipalism with the words of Russell without uh, falling into the local trap, showing the municipalities that they are being democratized and in charge, but actually giving them no legitimate power to deal with it. I think I'll stop here. Thank you.